The Soul is Not a Smithy by David Foster Wallace. Terence Veland would later be decorated in combat in the war in Indochina and had his photograph and a dramatic and flattering story about him in the dispatch. Although his whereabouts after discharge and returning to American life were never established by anyone Miranda or I ever knew of. This is the story of how Frank Caldwell, Chris DeMatteis, Mandy Blem, and I became, in the city newspaper's words, the four unwitting hostages, and of how our strange and special alliance and the trauma surrounding its origin bore on our subsequent lives and careers as adults later on. The repeated thrust of the dispatch articles was that it was we four, all classified as slow or problem pupils, who had not had the presence of mind to flee the civics classroom along with the other children, thereby creating the hostage circumstance that justified the taking of life. The site of the original trauma was fourth grade civics class, second period at R.B. Hayes Primary School here in Columbus. A very long time ago now, the class had a required seating chart and all of us had assigned desks, which were bolted to the floor in orderly rows. It was 1960, a time of fervent and somewhat unreflective patriotism. It was a time that is now often referred to as a somewhat more innocent time. Civics is a state-mandated class on the Constitution, the U.S. presidents, and the branches of government. In the second quarter, we had actually built papier-mâché models of the branches of government with various tracks and paths between them, to illustrate the balance of powers that the Founding Fathers had built into the federal system. I had fashioned the Doric columns of the judicial branch out of the cardboard cylinders inside rolls of coronet paper towels, which was our mother's preferred brand. It was during the cold and seemingly endless period in March when our regular civics teacher was absent that we had our Constitution unit in Peru's the American Constitution and its various drafts and amendments under the supervision of Mr. Richard A. Johnson a long-term sub. There was no recognized term for maternity leave then, although Mrs. Roseman's pregnancy had been obvious since at least Thanksgiving. The civics classroom at R.B. Hayes consisted of six rows of five desks each. The desks and chairs were bolted securely to each other and to the floor and had hinged liftable desktops, just as all primary classrooms desks tended to in that era before backpacks and book bags. Inside your assigned desk was where you stored your number two pencils, theme paper, paste, and various other essentials of primary school education. It was also where you were required to place your textbook out of view during in-class tests. I can remember that the theme paper of that era was light gray, soft, and slippery, with very wide rules of dotted blue. All assignments completed on this paper came out looking somewhat blurred. Up to the sixth grade in Columbus, one had an assigned homeroom. This was a specific classroom where you kept your winter coat and rubbers on a hook, and a rectangle of newspaper, respectively, along the wall, a pupil-specific hook designated with a piece of colored construction paper with your first name and last initial printed in magic marker. It was under the lid of your homeroom desktop that you kept your central cache of school supplies. At that time, the most grown-up thing about fishing your secondary school across the street seemed to be that the upperclassmen there had no homeroom but went from room to room for various classes and stored their materials in a locker with a combination lock, whose combination you had to memorize and then destroy the slip of paper on which the combination was given so that no one could break into your locker. None of this is directly relevant to the story of how the unlikely quartet of myself, Krista Mateis, Frankie Caldwell, and the strange and disturbed Mandy Blem were brought by circumstance to coalesce into what became known more informally as the Four except perhaps for the fact that art and civics were the only two classes for which we left our homeroom. Both of these classes used special facilities and materials, so both had their own quarters and specially trained teachers, and the pupils came to them from their respective homerooms at specified periods. This was, in our case, second period. The single file line in which we proceeded from homeroom to Mrs. Barry's and Mrs. Roseman's respective art and civics rooms was silent, alphabetical, and closely supervised. The very late 50s and early 60s were not a time of lax discipline or disorder, which made what occurred in civics on the day in question all the more traumatic and caused several of the class's children, one of whom was Terence Villan, who was perhaps somewhat a feat for a boy of that era, and sometimes wore sandals and leather shorts, 
but was extremely good at both soccer and kick soccer, and had a father who was a hydraulic engineer from West Germany who had attained American citizenship, and could also roll his eyelids up in such a way as to disclose the mucous membranes of their insides and then walk around the playground like that, which lent him a certain cachet, to transfer out of Hayes Primary for good, as even just being back in the building caused traumatic, preservative memories and emotions. Only much later would I understand that the incident at the chalkboard in civics was likely to be the most dramatic and exciting event I would ever be involved in in my life. As with the case of my father, I think that I am ultimately grateful not to have been aware of this at the time. My seat was to what would have been Mrs. Roseman's considerable chagrin now next to the window, who has always possessed good peripheral vision. And for much of Mr. Johnson's three weeks on the U.S. Constitution, I had primarily attended civics in body only, my real attention directed peripherally at the fields and street outside, which the window mesh's calibration divided into discrete squares that appeared to look quite like the rows of panels comprising cartoon strips, filmic storyboards, Alfred Hitchcock mystery comics, and the like. Obviously, this intense preoccupation was lethal in terms of my listening skills during second period civics, in that it led my attention not merely to wander idly, but to actively construct whole linear, discreetly organized narrative fantasies, many of which unfolded in considerable detail. That is to say that anything in any way remarkable in the view outside, such as a piece of vivid litter blowing from one wire square to the next, or a city bus flowing stolidly from right to left through the lowest three horizontal columns of squares, became the impetus for privately imagined films or cartoon storyboards in which each of the remaining squares of the window's wire mesh could be used to continue and deepen the panel's narrative. The ordinary-looking CPT bus, in fact, commandeered by Batman's then arch-nemesis, the Red Commando, who in an interior view in successive squares holds hostage, among others, Miss Vlastos, several blind children from the State School for the Blind and Deaf, and my terrified older brother and his piano teacher, Mrs. Doudna, until the moving bus is penetrated by Batman and, behind his small decorative mask, a markedly familiar-looking Robin, through a series of acrobatic rope and grappling hook maneuvers, each one of which filled and animated one reticulate square of the window, and then was frozen in tableau as my attention moved onto the next panel, and so on. These imagined constructions, which often took up the entire window, were difficult and concentrated work. The truth is that they bore little resemblance to what Mrs. Claymore, Mrs. Taylor, Miss Vlastos, or my parents called daydreaming. At the time of the inciting trauma, I was still nine years old. My 10th birthday would be April 8th. Ages 7 to nearly 10 were also the troubling and upsetting period, particularly for my parents, when I could not, in any strictly accepted sense, read. By which I mean that I could scan a page from From Sea to Shining Sea the story of America in words and pictures, which was the mandated textbook for all primary school civics classes statewide at that time, and supply a certain amount of specific quantitative information, such as the exact number of words per page, the exact number of words on each line, and often the word and even letter with the most and the fewest occurrences of use on a given page. For example, as well as the number of occurrences of each word, often retaining this information long after the page had been read, and yet could not, in the vast majority of cases, internalize or communicate in any very satisfactory way what the words and their various combinations were intended to mean, this is my memory of the period at any rate, with the result that I performed well below average when tested on homework assimilation and reading comprehension. Much to everyone's relief, the reading problem reversed itself almost as mysteriously as it had first appeared somewhere around my 10th birthday.